Now at this point in our study of a topic such as this, piecewise functions, the inevitable question from a student arises. A student asks, why do we have to know this? And, uh, and there's a lot of reasons. One reason is for further study of math, piecewise functions will show up. Piecewise functions end up being a very useful in calculus, for example, to demonstrate certain concepts dealing with continuity of functions. So you will see these again if you continue to study math. Um, but piecewise functions also show up in the real world. In the real world, things don't always go in a smooth, continuous fashion. Things suddenly change at certain points. And so functions that can suddenly change at certain values can be used to model these things in the real world. A couple of fairly obvious examples uh, deal with payments. Different pay rates might apply in different situations. And one, one example of that is overtime pay. And this is fairly typical. An employee might be paid $5 an hour to work a standard 40-hour work week. So standard 40-hour work week, that's a standard week. You work uh, eight hours a day for five days, that's 40 hours. And you get paid some hourly rate. In this case, it's $5 per hour. But if you work overtime, if you put in overtime, it's common to get paid what they call time and a half. So instead of $5, you're paid one and a half times that. Your regular pay rate that's what they mean by time, how much you get paid per amount of time, and a half. So one and a half times that. So you get paid $7.50 per hour for every hour over 40 hours. So if you had a graph, if you made a graph of your pay, which would be in dollars, versus your time in hours, then there's this value of 40 right here. And the, if, you, if, you, if you work zero hours, you get zero pay. So this point is on the graph right here. But the more you work, the more you get paid. And your, your pay steadily increases up to the 40-hour point. Now, if you work beyond 40 hours, you start earning money at a faster rate. So this, this graph gets steeper. And it maintains that steepness up to 80 hours. And at 80 hours, they make you stop. They don't let you work more than 80 hours. At least in this particular case, we're told there's a maximum of 80 hours. So the graph doesn't go on beyond 80. And you could use these numbers, $5 and the time and a half, $7.50, to calculate these particular Y values or particular pay values to get the amounts that you would be paid for working different numbers of hours. But you see this function clearly has this, this point here at which the definition changes. We think of our pay defined one way when our time is less than 40 hours, and our pay is defined another way when the time is greater than 40 hours. OK, here's another example, a water bill. This is actual data from um, San Diego in 2009. Uh, the city billed its citizens for water at the following rates. Okay, two dollars and ninety-eight cents per hundred cubic feet. That's what HCA, HCF stands for. A hundred cubic feet. You pay two dollars and ninety-eight cents for each hundred cub, hundred cubic feet for the first fourteen hundred cubic feet. Now, if you go over a hundred cubic feet or fourteen hundred cubic feet of water usage, they hit you with a higher rate. So they're giving you an incentive to conserve water here. In other words, they stick it to you with a higher pay per cubic foot or per 100 cubic feet if you use too much. So between 14 and 28, the second 1,400 cubic feet, you pay this higher rate, 323. And then if you go over 2,800 cubic feet, then you pay an even higher rate. So they're providing a disincentive to waste water. So if we were to graph this, this would be defined in three pieces. We won't write out the definition, although we could. But let's just graph the cost here, which would be in dollars, versus the volume of water used. And the volume would be in hundreds of cubic feet. And the, the critical points here are 1,400 cubic feet and 2,800 cubic feet. And the point zero here. Obviously, a, a cost of zero if you use zero water. And so you have an increasing cost for water usage up to 1,400 cubic feet. 
and then increasing at a higher rate up to 2,800 cubic feet and then an even higher rate beyond that. So your graph would look something like this, defined in three pieces. And we could use, again, we could use this data to calculate these exact y values or to calculate the y value or the cost for any any value of the volume. And I'll show you one more example of a piecewise function and this one comes from physics and this deals with gravity. And what I want you to do is imagine the earth. So let's draw a picture here. Here's the earth and imagine you're standing on the surface of the earth here. Obviously not drawn to scale. The, the gravity, the mass of the earth exerts this gravitational pull downward on you. And how much pull you feel downward depends on the size of the earth. So the, a bigger, a more massive planet exerts more gravitational force. So now imagine digging a really deep hole way down toward the center of the earth. If you go, if you go down this hole, say you go down to this depth, well part of the earth is up above you at that case. And, and, and the, the earth up above you isn't pulling you down. Gravity only pulls. And it turns out, and you can show this from physics, that the earth that has a radius, that the, the portion of the Earth that has a radius that is beneath you is what exerts a gravitational pull. So as you go down into this deep well, say you get down to this point, this much of the Earth is beneath you. The rest of the Earth is out beyond your distance. So only this much of the Earth is pulling on you. So when you're down inside the Earth, you don't feel as much gravity because it's like there's a smaller planet underneath you pulling you down. And if you went way down here, then it would be like a tiny little planet here pulling you. So the, the gravitational force is small when you're down in the center. So let's imagine you have this, this theoretical hole all the way to the center of the Earth. Right here there would be no gravity. And as you went further out, there would be more and more Earth beneath you and by the time you got out to the surface, all the way to the surface, all of the earth would be beneath you, pulling you down. So we can make a graph here, and we're going to graph the gravitational force as a function of distance. And if we start at zero and we go out to the radius of the earth, it turns out that this is a linear function. Gravity gradually gets stronger and stronger until you get out to a distance equal to the surface of the earth. Now, once you leave the Earth's surface, if you continue going outward, the farther and farther away you get from the Earth, the weaker gravity gets. And this is an inverse square function. It curves down something like this. Now, I'm not proving that to you. You can do some physics to prove that this is, in fact, linear, and this is, in fact, an inverse square function. And I'm not going to go through the physics right now to demonstrate that, but I'm just showing you this is an example of, of a piecewise function. The gravitational pull at various distances x inside the Earth would be defined by one function and then if those distances continue outside the Earth the gravitational pull is defined by another function. Now we don't obviously, we don't ever dig down into the Earth that deep but, but it is an interesting example from a theory standpoint and the, the, the mathematical demonstrations of these functions represent some good understanding of both math and physics.